a standoff between a man who is wanted by the FBI and a large number of federal agents. The man has been holed up in a cabin in a remote section of Idaho with his wife, three daughters, and a friend. The 11-day siege that ended with the death of Randy Weaver's wife, 13-year-old son, and family dog was a massive embarrassment for the FBI. All the children to get one man and take 800 of you. You call yourself an American? These are Americans. These are God-fearing people. You don't even know your constitution. To try to scare the average American so he won't open his mouth against the new world order. That's all this is. After entrapping an army vet into a non-violent crime, the feds wired his mountaintop property with cameras and began making armed patrols of his land. After harassing the family for a while, they kicked off an 11-day standoff by killing Randy's dog and 13-year-old son. I came to point my mind out that I knew it was all dead. And it's just a matter of time. And it didn't even matter. I was hoping that if they killed any, any of us, they were gonna kill us all and do it quick because I didn't want to see my kids suffer. Not only didn't show up to court, he's like a wild animal up in his territory. We're going to have to go get him. Born in Villisca, Iowa in 1948, Randall Claude Weaver was one of four children being raised in a Christian household. Randall, or Randy, as he would come to be known, was a smart and assertive kid. And after graduating high school in 1966, he enrolled in Iowa Central Community College. In 1968, though, he dropped out to serve his country in the height of the Vietnam War. It's hard to say if it was spurred by a patriotic calling or if Randy just saw the writing on the wall. It was only the following year that Nixon called for two draft lotteries to fill the American fighting ranks. During his time in the armed forces, Randy Weaver was a clear standout amongst the cannon fodder. He was only enlisted three years before being honorably discharged, but in that time, he climbed to the rank of Green Beret. After being admitted back into civilian life, Randy Weaver jumped right back into higher education. He started studying criminal justice at the University of Northern Iowa. His end goal was to become an FBI agent. But around the same time, life would throw Randy an unimaginable curveball by the name of Victoria Jordison. Randy was head over heels, and he proposed within a year of meeting her. The two were wed at the First Congressional Church in Fort Dodge, Iowa, and they began forming their family. The couple had three children together, Sarah, Samuel, and Rachel. Eventually, the expenses of a growing family priced Randy out of the tuition needed to continue schooling, but he was happy to pivot focus. Since the day he'd met Vicky, making her a happy woman had became his ultimate goal. Randy got a job working at the John Deere factory nearby and began engrossing himself in his wife's heavily religious views. In fact, it was Vicky who ultimately decided that moving to a remote cabin would be best. Randy had always been weary of the government, but he himself had been on a path to join the FBI. But when Vicky laid out her beliefs, that the impending apocalypse would be brought upon by an authoritarian government overstepping their rights to bring citizens to their knees, Randy began to see it too. The two formed a plan to get away from the cities and raise their family in private. 
For years, Randy took trips to northern Iowa to construct a new home for the Weavers, while Vicki researched information that she would need to raise children without running water or electricity. Once the cabin was completed, Randy and Vicki moved their family to their new remote home near Ruby Creek. After settling in on the ridge, they began to make a new life work for themselves. 40 miles from the Canadian border, the land was fairly remote. By the accounts of the children that survived the events we're talking about today, life was great on Ruby Ridge. The kids could run free and explore nature as they desired. The Weavers even had a fourth child there on the ridge. Baby girl Elisheba was born in a birthing shed, a small cabin that Randy had built to give Vicky some privacy during the labor process. The family carried on studying their religion and preparing themselves for any wretched overbearing that the US government may bring. During the months and years to follow, the Weavers did their best to make connections in their small, porous, mountaintop community. And unbeknownst to the Weavers, this is where their paths would cross with certain death. Their distant neighbors all shared a few things with the Weavers. They were all white, Christian, and hated the federal government. And it would seem that despite the sparse population, the demographics that did make up the mountaintop community were ideal for the Aryan nations to make a financial investment. And many of those within the mountainside community attended regular meetings at the local Aryan nations headquarters. But like most controversial groups, these recruitment tactics are packed with incentives and a sense of community, but only come with a small sampling of the group's veiled ideas. We know a lot more about the Aryan nations and groups like them now, but the landscape politically was much different in the 1980s. So you must understand that not everybody on the ridge was a white supremacist, not even close. But in an area with such little resources, the Aryan nation's message and dollar could be amplified by the investments they made here. And this was because locals relied on events and functions that they put on, like summer camps for kids. Because there were no real viable alternatives for the kids there 40 miles from the Canadian border. Despite this, Randy and Vicky both formally declined the invitation to join the Aryan Nation, but continued, as many did, attending the community events that were put on for recruitment purposes. In this heavy recruiting and marketing dump by the Aryan nations into this mountaintop community was not unnoticed by federal employees. Quite the contrary. Countless U.S. tax dollars began being spent on infiltrating these groups, which translated to a barrage of white crew-cut feds sent to pose as white supremacists and spy on institutions like the Aryan nations. And it was when one of these undercover feds befriended Randy Weaver and asked for a favor that his problems really started. Now remember, Randy viewed all these interactions as cordial and neighborly. And after leaving his job on the line at John Deere, he was looking for new ways to make a quick buck. So when this fed asked Weaver to saw off the ends of a couple shotguns for him, he was happy to make some extra money and help a new friend at the same time. Unfortunately, there was a third thing also happening. Randy Weaver was committing a federal felony by making these simple alterations, which was the goal of the entire ask. On October 24th, 1989, Randy Weaver returned his handiwork to his new friend, who in turn revealed that he was an undercover fed. Randy's new friend explained the crime that he had just committed, and their interactions ceased until June 12th of the following year. 
That is when the agent approached Randy about becoming an informant for the Aryan Nations group that had brought the two together. Randy told him plain and clear that he wasn't a part of that group and that he couldn't help them. Still, they persisted and threatened to charge him with altering the shotguns. After Randy refused to be the federal government's earpiece, his arrest was imminent. In December of 1990, Randy Weaver was officially indicted by a federal court for selling illegal weapons to an undercover agent. And on January 17, 1991, over a year after handing off the shotguns, Randy and his wife were arrested. The ATF had pretended to be a car broken down in the snow, knowing the Weavers were heading down the pass. When Randy and Vicky got out to help, they were both thrown in the snow and cuffed. Vicky was released with the children, who were watching horrified from within the car as the scene played out. Randy, however, was taken in by authorities and posted bond with the deed to his home the next day as he had no previous criminal record. The Weavers didn't know what to do. They figured their crime was a clear case of entrapment and a victimless one to boot. After a lot of praying, Randy Weaver decided that he wasn't going into court. Best case scenario, the feds let it go and move on to a more valuable mark. Worst case, they would have to come up to the ridge and remove Randy and his family from the cabin. And unfortunately for the Weavers and all the federal bodies that would get involved, they started down that second path. On March 14, 1991, Randy Weaver was indicted for failure to appear at trial. And for the next 18 months, Randy Weaver, his wife, and their three children began the 18-month sit-in. Their fourth child, baby Elisheba, would be born during this time. The Weavers did their best to live off the land, but friends helped keep them supplied. One of these people was a man named Kevin Harris, a man that they had welcomed into their own family when he was on hard times. Aside from helping them keep their pantry stocked, Kevin Harris would stay at the cabin periodically. For a few months, nothing changed and nothing happened, until... After a little pressure from the higher-ups, the federal marshals began surveillance on the property. They rigged trees with motion-activated trail cameras, and of course these trail cameras would be found by the weavers, leading to an increased armament level for everybody out there, including the kids. With tension and fear at an all-time high, Randy Weaver called upon his family friend Kevin Harris to help keep his family safe. At this point, we are nearly two years out from Randy Weaver missing his court date, and the suspicious activity on the property had only increased in the past year or so. From the Weaver's perspective, it was tough to identify the motivation or intentions of their stalkers. On August 21st, 1992, the Weavers were going about their daily chores when one of the family dogs, Stryker, started barking in the direction of the tree line toward the path. By this time, the Weavers had become accustomed to living off the land and hunting was a large part of their lives, and Stryker proved to be a valuable resource in these efforts as he would often alert the family to nearby game. On that day, Kevin Harris and 14-year-old Samuel Weaver took off behind the dog, rifles in hand, hoping to take down a deer or some other large meal. Unbeknownst to Kevin or young Samuel, the dog was picking up traces of a passing group of encroaching U.S. Marshals, and Stryker would lead them straight to the Marshals at a point on the trail that has come to be known as the Y, a point along the footpath where it splits 
and it was at this intersection that the first fatal shots were fired. How exactly the next 20 or 30 seconds played out is heavily disputed by both sides. According to the U.S. Marshals, Stryker approached with Kevin and Samuel in tow. The Marshals identified themselves, but were met with gunfire from Kevin Harris who immediately killed U.S. Marshal William Deegan, the man leading the surveillance on the Weaver's property. Gunfire was then returned by the two surviving Marshals striking and killing the family dog and 14-year-old Samuel Weaver. Kevin Harris managed to get back to the cabin through the trees and the marshals claimed that they did not know that they had killed Samuel. According to the other side, events played out much differently. And given the facts that we know today, I'm much more inclined to believe this second version. As Stryker approached the Y, he took off ahead of Kevin and Samuel around the bend. Kevin said he saw Stryker again a moment later when he was standing in front of a man wearing camouflage. The dog was jumping at the man who seemed to be holding a pistol at first, but then Kevin realized it was a silenced submachine gun. Stryker jumped at the man's hands a couple times, as he was known to do when he was playing, before circling the man and sitting down before him. Kevin recalls thinking about telling the man, don't worry, he won't bite but before he could, a burst of gunfire sent Stryker slumping and seizing onto his side. Samuel approached his fallen pet and yelled out, You killed my dog, you son of a bitch, before readying his weapon. Kevin saw the marshals reacting to what they saw as a threat before diving into the bushes for cover as Samuel Harris was shot in the arm and in the back by the U.S. Marshals. Now fearing for his own life, Kevin Harris returned fire through the brush at the location he thought the marshals were standing, ultimately killing U.S. Marshal William Deegan. After several minutes of what seemed like silence, Kevin approached Samuel's body to check on him. He confirmed Samuel was indeed deceased before getting out of harm's way on the path and back into the trees. When Kevin told Randy and Vicky that their son was dead, they asked if he was sure. Kevin confirmed that their son was dead as his parents fell apart before him. Randy began screaming and cursing. He raised his gun in the air and started firing off wildly in anguish. Vicky broke down and began to cry before demanding that they go get his body. Kevin attempted to talk them out of it, thinking they too would surely be shot dead, but it was a fool's errand. Finally, he agreed to stay behind at the cabin with Sarah, Rachel, and Elisheba. He watched Randy and Vicky disappear down the trail, knowing he may be protecting kids whose parents may never come home. He said he knew when they found Sam's body, because he could hear Vicky's grief-stricken cries, followed by Randy's own screams. At least one member of the U.S. Marshals would later claim to hear the same cries over the dead boy but it would seem this information was withheld. Once Randy and Vicky made it back to the tree line with their son's body, they called out to Kevin for help. Vicky was exhausted and she needed a break. Kevin took Vicky's place and the two got Samuel all the way to the pump house before Randy too was spent. Kevin then picked up Samuel's body, putting him over his shoulder and carried him to the birthing shed that Randy had built for Vicky to have Elisheba and laid him on the bed. He then left Vicky and Randy there to clean up their son and grieve. When the surviving two marshals reported the incident, there was no mention of shooting a child, and a heavy emphasis on the marshal now laying dead at the hands of who they described as a dangerous white separatist who would never be taken alive. Based on the incomplete information sent up the chain, the state and federal authorities began converging on Ruby Ridge overnight. Armored vehicles rumbled down the back trails and helicopters buzzed over the terrain. By the morning of August 22, 1992, there were over a hundred law enforcement personnel forming a perimeter around the Weaver's property, and more were arriving by the hour. 
all agencies involved were outraged at the death of U.S. Marshal Deegan, and the FBI drew up special rules of engagement for the operation. If any adult in the area around the cabin is observed with a weapon after the surrender announcement has been made, deadly force could and should be used to neutralize the individual. If any male is observed with a weapon prior to the announcement, deadly force can and should be employed if the shot can be taken without endangering any children. Of all the dangerous and compromising situations the FBI finds themselves in, this was the first time rules like these were drawn up against U.S. citizens. Aside from the amassing militaristic forces, there was also what at first was a crowd of curious locals beginning to form there on the ridge. For most of the morning of Saturday, August 22nd, things were fairly still. Or at least they seemed that way. And that's because the FBI had been drawing up those rules of engagement. But once they'd been approved, they were being handed down to FBI snipers at 2.30 p.m. At 3.30, the sniper units depart on foot into the wilderness towards their respective outposts. At 5.15, the sniper teams arrive at their locations and begin to watch over the Weaver property. The morning had looked a little different from the Weaver's perspective. From inside the cabin, the forces surrounding the location was impossible to miss. The air was thick with sirens and the sounds of choppers flying overhead. The family was scared and pinned down, and no one really spoke much. Randy and Kevin turned on the radio, and they discovered that Kevin had killed a deputy marshal, and that explained the sirens and the choppers that they had heard all morning. The cabin had meant safety to the Weaver family. But that afternoon, in order to take care of a few things, they decided to brave whatever horrors await them outside that front door. Randy was going out to see his son one more time before his mortal body was too far gone. It would be too dark in the birthing shed, so Kevin Harris offered to run and grab some batteries for the flashlight that he knew were only a short walk away from the house. And eldest daughter Sarah wanted to check on their other dog who had been whimpering outside all morning. They all armed themselves and stepped outside. Sarah checked on the dog and gave her the food that she had prepared before heading out while the adults took off in either direction. Sarah was fast behind her father and caught up to him before he got to the birthing shed. By this time Kevin had not yet made it to the batteries when he heard a shot ring out, followed by Randy screaming. I'm hit! Vicky heard her husband's cries and began to run out after him. But she was holding their 10 month old baby Elishaba and when she saw Randy was able to get up on his own accord, she ran back into the doorway. She held the door open, screaming for everyone to get inside. Randy and Sarah were ahead of Kevin, who was sprinting to catch up. And then a second shot echoed through the ridge. Kevin Harris recalls the shot while he was looking at Vicky's face. It was as if there was something moving under her skin and then her face was deformed and almost seemed to explode. Sarah Weaver, who was first in the doorway, was sprayed with her mother's brain matter, and baby Elisheba dropped to the cabin floor. Vicki Weaver was 42 years old. Kevin Harris also dropped to the ground, though it took him a moment to realize that he had also been hit. A discovery that he only made once he couldn't feel his left hand. Randy and Sarah helped Kevin to remove his jacket, which had already began filling with blood, before they helped him into a chair. The Weavers were being hunted. 
Randy's wife and son lay dead, while he and Kevin were likely to die there hiding in the cabin because going outside wasn't going to be an option. The family cowered in their home, waiting to die, Randy and Kevin now each wounded, and the three little girls scared to death. The FBI sharpshooter who had killed Vicki Weaver and wounded Randy and Kevin, named Lon Horiuchi, later claimed that he had fired because he thought that the group was about to shoot at a surveillance helicopter. And where this may excuse the shot at Randy, it's hard to imagine that firing at a doorway as people sprint into a cabin for cover can be viewed the same way, especially when one of those people is a child. For a second time, the incidents on the ridge were being reported much differently to the public. The sharpshooter said nothing about shooting off Vicki Weaver's wig, and the story that the public continued to hear was that the family was full of suicidal white supremacists. They would surely shoot it out until the end. There was no mention of Vicky or Samuel Weaver, or the incompetence that led to their deaths. The following morning of August 23, 1992, FBI agents moved in on the Weaver's cabin, tightening their perimeter and attempting to gather intelligence on the family's whereabouts. And it was during this sweep, as the family cowered in fear, that the agents found Samuel Weaver's body in the birthing shed. They retrieved his corpse and took it back, but they could no longer hide the blood on their hands. An outrage amongst the Idaho locals erupted. Come on! Baby killer! Baby killer! Baby killer! Baby killer! Baby killer! Later that day, Kevin Harris was formally charged with killing Marshall Deegan, and Kevin was charged with lesser federal crimes. For the next several days, the ridge remained relatively still as police started coming up with a better plan to deal with the family, especially now that their handiwork was starting to not look so great on national TV. They started using loudspeakers to attempt to communicate with the family because there was no phone inside the cabin. Every morning, they would use the system to call out to Vicky, telling her there was a warm breakfast waiting for her and the children if they would just come out. To anybody inside the cabin, though, this was incredibly insulting. They, as I do, found it hard to believe that the FBI didn't know that Vicki Weaver was dead. But even if she were alive, Vicki was the most religious and anti-government of the Weavers and would be the last to conform. And as animosity grew for the feds within the cabin, it continued to fester in the form of protests there on the ridge. The crowd, originally comprised of friends of the Weavers and concerned locals, was now teeming with race grifters and political figures looking to take advantage of the tragedy. On Tuesday, August 25th, 1992, a group of skinheads hoping that the Weavers were kicking off the race war were arrested when they were caught trying to drive up to the cabin with a car full of ammunition and firearms. And over the next several days, any attempts to reach out to Randy or anybody within the cabin failed. As days of increased media coverage shined a brighter and wider light on the FBI's lackluster handling of somebody who was becoming more and more sympathetic in the public eye, the FBI became more desperate for options. A man named Bo Greitz, who was running in the 1992 presidential election under the Populist Party, 
had already offered a few times to come down and assist with the FBI's negotiations. Bogreitz is relatively unknown today, but like Randy, he was a former Green Beret, and his campaign slogan was God, Guns, and Greitz. After days of making no progress themselves, the FBI agreed to let Bo talk to the Weavers on the night of Friday, August 28th. A full week after the death of Samuel Weaver, and nearly three years after Randy Weaver had been entrapped, the feds had finally made a good decision once they were fully under the public microscope. The FBI drove Bo Greitz out to the cabin and gave him a bullhorn. Bo starts calling out to Randy identifying himself before approaching the cabin against the wishes of the FBI. Bo was confident that he could get Randy's attention, and he was right, because Randy stuck his head out the window for a moment to confirm that it was Bo, before unloading the horrible truth that lay within the cabin. And when Bo informed the FBI that they had killed Vicki Weaver, a press conference that was set up that evening shows just how hard it was for them to admit. The three ch children are in good health. Kevin is all right, but he did suffer a wound. Randy's in good health. Unfortunately, Vicky is dead. On August 30th, Bo Greitz returned to the cabin to retrieve Vicky's body and check on the people within. And this is when he saw the declining state of Kevin Harris before getting Vicky's body into safe hands. Bo Greitz returned and demanded that Randy hand over Kevin, or Bo himself would testify in court that it was Randy that was responsible for Kevin, Kevin Harris' Harris. death, as he would inevitably die there in the cabin. It is then that Randy lets Bo take Kevin Harris down the hill. The following day, on Monday, August 31st, Bo returns to the cabin for the last time. With time running out, he pleads with Randy to come out, telling him that there is a massive lawsuit waiting for him at the bottom of the hill that would make his family rich. He explained all that they had to do was surrender, and their only other option was certain death. Randy answered by telling him that he had left it up to the girls that he, Sarah, and Rachel had prayed all night, and in the morning, he let the girls decide. 10-year-old Rachel and 16-year-old Sarah decided that the cops would have to kill them like they'd killed their mom and their brother. In a final desperate plea, Bo cursed Randy for having him take Vicky's body because it had meant nothing if they were going out like that. After a few moments in the cabin, the door opened. Randy was holding Elishba, and he turned to his daughters. Get your things, girls. We're going down the hill with Mr. Greitz. When Randy made it to the perimeter, he was taken into custody and flown to St. Luke's Hospital in Boise, Idaho. He was treated for a gunshot wound before taken directly to Ada County Jail and he would sit there in the FBI's mess until 1993, when his court case finally came around. Both he and Kevin Harris pleaded innocent to the various crimes they were accused of. When the sharpshooter that killed Vicki Weaver was called to the stand, he pled the fifth when asked to describe how he killed Vicki Weaver. And on July 8th of 1993, a jury would acquit both Weaver and Harris for the death of Deegan. Harris is also acquitted for all other counts, and Weaver is only convicted on two minor counts. In August of 1995, the Justice Department finally agrees to pay Weaver. They decide to give him $100,000, and each of his daughters $1 million. It was an expensive lesson for the FBI to learn, and one that came too late, because just six months after the siege on Ruby Ridge, came another 
more well-known siege in Waco, Texas. Thank you for watching, and if you want to see more of these kind of videos, or maybe even the Waco siege video, let me know in the comments below. If you enjoyed, hit the like button and consider subscribing. You might know this isn't the most ad-friendly content, so if you want to support the channel further, check out my Patreon page. Speaking of which, big shout out to Buckethead, Tang, Shane Stangy, Jacob Cruz, Low Quality Music Productions, Holy Spirit, and Sebastian. Y'all the real MVPs. Got some big stuff planned for 2022, so stick around. But as for this year, Manic out.